morning. How y'all doing? Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all the, the moms who are with us. Um, and then also because we just realized Mother's Day is, is filled with emotions. It's great celebration, but also just a time of reflection for so many people. It's, it's a time of, of grieving the fact that there's, there's seasons in life where we actually hope to be moms. Um, for those who are missing their moms, for those who are um, stepping into roles, whether men or women, of, of being a mother in the different stage and season of your life. And so and all those things as a family, we come together and we celebrate and we also grieve together. And so wherever you're at today, we just welcome you. We're glad you chose to um, be together on this day in whatever way that it means to you and just so uh, thankful that we get to do that together as a church. Uh, as Kathleen said, we are in part three of a six-part series called Gifted. And uh, who had fun last week? Who was here last week? We had six baptisms. Was that a little bit fun? Yeah. yeah? Uh, that was that was super exciting. It was a lot of fun. I wasn't even preaching, and I was exhausted yet last Sunday. It was just uh, it was a party. There's a lot of up and down and everything, and cheering and singing and dancing. So um, that was really fun. And it was really cool. Some of you don't know we have a, a downtown site as well. In fact, most weeks, whoever is preaching here actually heads out the back door and drives down. They have an 11 o'clock service. We literally drive in. And worship's just ending, and then preach the message all over again. Uh, and so, uh, and some of you are like, I, I live downtown. Why am I coming all the way to cornfields? That's down, and 11, it's really it's later than 10. That could work for me. It could, I'll see you there. Uh, so anyways, that's at 11. And so last week, they didn't have baptisms. They were celebrating something else. They were celebrating uh, one of the people that is part of the Lakeside Church, one of our members, um, but actually their family uh, goes to the downtown site and they've actually just been affirmed as a new elder. And so just wanna celebrate with downtown that they were actually uh, commissioning Beth Round, who's actually joining our elder team. We're so excited to have her. And... Uh, just really neat that as a lakeside family, we have two locations and we have, you know, people that are all part of that family and partners in both sites and uh, people who serve on the board from both sites to look at not just what's best for us up here, what's best for them down there, but what's best for us um, as a, a church community and for this city and this region. And so uh, just so excited to welcome her and, and how exciting that is. Um, I want to start off by asking you a question, okay? I want you to fill in the blank. You don't have to say it out loud. I'm not going to pass the microphone around. I just want you to think about it, okay? And it's simply this. I would be great if I. I would be great if I, and then you fill it in however you want. It may be if I had, and then you have something to say. I'd be great if I hadn't. I'd be great if I had thought of, if I was born with, if I didn't have to. However you want to answer that. Just take a moment, take a moment, take a moment, and say, I'd be great if I, and then however you want to fill it out, okay? Take a moment. As you're kind of filling in that blank, I'd be great if I, and you're kind of, you know, some of you, it's like you're going back through history three, four weeks. Others of you are like three, four decades. You got lots of things to process, taking a little longer, right? But you're just like, you know, I'd be, I'd be a little bit greater if I had read a little bit more, or if I was a little bit smarter, a little bit faster, a little bit prettier, a little bit sexier, if I had been born into this family and not this family, I'd probably be a little bit greater. Um, I'd be great if I hadn't struggled or don't struggle with this. I'd be great if I had gotten a degree. Maybe you felt like I'd be great if I had gotten multiple degrees. Some of you are like, I'd probably be in a better place if I hadn't wasted my time on a degree, right? There's just all different ways you can look at that. Some of you are like, I'd, it would have been greater if I could have found someone and been married. Others of you are married and you're like, it would have been great if I hadn't been married. You just feel like that tied you down. Some of you are like, life would have been good and greater if I had had kids, if I could have been a dad, if I could have been a mom. Others of you, like if I hadn't made that decision, hadn't become a parent or a parent when I did, things would be greater. Others of you, you kind of reflected back on an event that was, you know, specifically painful in your life. You're like, things would have been greater, and I would have been greater, and I would have been a, a better person if that event in university hadn't happened. If I had been privileged or had the opportunity that they had. If I hadn't wasted all that time. If I, you know, had, had finally finished high school, or, you know, if I had dropped out of high school, then I could have been like Bill Gates. No, I think he actually dropped out of like Harvard or something. When they say he's a dropout, he dropped out of, anyways. Uh, if I had been like so-and-so, you fill in the blank, right? Whatever it is, wherever you're at, you have something that you think about. If your gut level honest, it's like, I would have been greater if. And while we can kind of go through all those things, and usually we have an image of someone that we're thinking about, right? I could have been more like this person. I could have been more like this person, whether they're an actor, a politician, a celebrity, someone who's really good in your field or industry, uh, or just another parent that you just feel like, I just, I just love the way they parent. I could have been a greater parent 
if I had you know, done things differently, made better decisions when the kids were young, whatever it is, I could have been great if. And the interesting thing, and this is, this is kind of a simple principle, you don't really think about it, but it's, it's real, and I just wanna call it out, and then you'll resonate with it. It doesn't matter if you're a church person or not, religious or not, this is just a, such a good principle. It's simply this, it's that sometimes, 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 you can do great things. Sometimes you can do great things and not be great. That sometimes you can actually do great things. You could have finished that degree. You could have gone to college. You could have married that person. You could have accomplished great things. And yet, in the eyes of the world, and maybe if you're gut level honest, in the eyes of yourself, you are not great. We've all kind of experienced that recently. You look at politics and you see politicians and they've done incredible things and they've written works and they've argued and fought for rights in certain areas and then something comes out and we realize they've done great things, but I don't know if I'd categorize them as great people that I want my children to be like anymore. We've seen this over the last few years with athletes who we just are so impressed by the things that they've come over and charities they've started and incredible things and all of a sudden something comes out and we realize they're doing great things, but they're not great. And all of a sudden we just pause and realize there's something that people can start a charity and devote their entire life to incredible work and fighting on behalf of a certain group of people. And then something comes out and we realize they did great things, but they're not great. You've seen that even in the religious world. You've seen that with religious leaders and pastors, people in my line of work. And it's like, we're just so amazed at them for decades. We're so impressed by them. And then something comes out and the stories start to unravel. And we start to realize that you can do great things and not be great. Some of you, this was like growing up in your home, you know, with your parents. It's like whenever people met you, they're like, what's your last name again? Is this your dad? Oh, wow. I love your dad. And you're just thinking like, you never lived with him. You have no idea. It's like, he's done some great things. And yes, I know his title and I know all the letters that come after his name, but I don't consider him to be great. Some of you, this was someone that you were in a relationship, maybe your spouse, you were the plus one at a wedding, you were going to a business party, and they're like, oh, you're with him or you're with her? Wow, they're so amazing, and I can, their doors always open. I know how busy they are, but they will always help. It must be so incredible. I see you're raising kids with them. They must be so servant-hearted because they're so amazing. You're like, that has never come through the front door. I have never experienced her like that. I've never experienced him like that. You can do great things and not be great. Some of you have had that with a boss. That someone finds out who you work for and it's like, I would kill to work for them. You'd say, I'd kill to not work for them and I'd tell you who I'd kill. <laughs> that it is possible, very possible to do great things and not be great. And the reason we're talking about this today is because we're right at the half point of a series called Gifted. And if you're here for the first time, you're here for Mother's Day, out of town, visiting family, friends, please don't feel like you're coming in the middle of a movie and it's like, great, because I'm like that. I hate coming in the middle of a movie. Today we'll stand on its own and it's, you know, at Lakeside, we love helping people discover, fully follow Jesus. So we always say, wherever you're at in your quest, whatever you believe, don't believe, asking questions, wrestling, we're so glad you're here. We're gonna try and create on-ramps to you to wrestle. We just, we love that. We're not a black and white in or out. We love the journey and the process. Jesus, who we model everything after, loved inviting people. He didn't say, hey, stop this, stop that, stop this, stop that. Now that you got it all right together, you can come follow me. He just simply said two words. It was relational. It was follow me. And so wherever you're at on that quest, we just so invite your journey and we're so glad because we love Jesus and think he'll transform your life. But we want you to approach that and bring your questions and bring your wrestlings and all those things. And today's a perfect day for that as we kind of wrestle through uh, maybe some of the things that have actually been the, the, the guardrail, so to speak, that has kept you away from faith. And in the midst of this series, we've been kind of uncovering this idea of gifted. And basically, the, the premise of the series is this question to say, what would it be like if Jesus' people actually lived the way that Jesus called us to live? Because the incredible thing is you talk to people, people who aren't even religious, and they look back in history like, I like Jesus. I like the things he taught. I'm not sure if he was God incarnate, but I really like Jesus. It's the Jesus people I'm not sure about. Like, there's, those are two different categories. It's like, but those actually were supposed to be synonymous. We were supposed to be like him. And so it's like, so if we actually lived that out, what would it look like? In the last few weeks, we've been talking about how that would actually be a gift. That even when you look through 2,000 years of Christian history, you discover when the Jesus people followed Jesus and lived lives in response to his spirit, which we'll unpack in a bit, the world took notice. That people who didn't believe what the Christians believed were glad the Christians believed it because it directly impacted their life and their culture. 
And so the last two weeks, we've been unpacking that. Week one, we talked about our identity, how we have a new identity. We're one, we're many. If that makes no sense to you, don't worry. You can just catch it up on your YouTube channel. Go to our website, you'll find the links and you can follow up that narrative. Last week, Daniel Bell was preaching at both sites. He talked about, and how does this work? How does God use the community of God, one and many, to help people encounter his presence in their lives? And he talked about how there's gifts of the spirit. Everybody has a gift. He kind of walked us through all those things. God chooses the gift. And when you use your spiritual gift, it's unlike a human gift gift. Human gifts make people say, wow, you're awesome. Spiritual gifts, when you use them right, make people say, wow, God is awesome. They actually help people encounter God. And we're all about that here at Lakeside. We want people to encounter God. It's our first core value. We want to help this region encounter God. And so today's kind of an interesting cross section because some of you are like, we've been in a series on spiritual gifts. We're in week three and you're still not telling us anything about spiritual gifts. And it's going to be another week before I get there. Okay. But here's what we need to do, because we've been in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 the last two weeks, and today we go to 1 Corinthians 13. And 1 Corinthians 13 is kind of like the pause button that the Apostle Paul, who's writing it, hits in that moment. It's kind of like when you're going to driving school, you know that first day you're like 16 years old, and you got that person, they got the brake pedal on the floor that they overuse, and... Uh, Maybe they just, anyways, okay. Anyway, so anyways, you're in the car and you're like, okay, mirrors and blind spot, and you check it all out, steering wheel tilt and seat up, down, okay, right? And you can, radio off, don't worry, it's off, right? And then you go to turn it on and they're just like, whoa, seat belt. Like, Sorry. This is what Paul's doing. In this moment, he's telling me, he's like, listen, listen, you have a new identity as Christians. You're one, you're many, you have these incredible spiritual gifts, you can help people encounter God. It's like, great, what are my spiritual gifts? How do I get it? And he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Chapter 13, I need to just pause for a second. Because there's something so incredibly important that if we miss, and we will discover many have missed it, it will not be a blessing and it will not be a gift, it will be a curse to the world around us. And so if you want to pull out your device to 1 Corinthians 13, or you have an actual paper Bible, they still make those. I have one at home. Um, whatever you're comfortable with, pull it out. If you don't have one, don't feel bad. I'll have it up on the screen in a few moments. But 1 Corinthians 13, we're going to jump into it. And you might actually recognize, some of you are like, I don't even read my Bible much, or I, I, I'm not even a Jesus person, but I know this passage because it's probably read at like 90% of weddings. It's the love is patient, love is kind. It does not, you know that, you know, every wedding has, it's not even about weddings, it's not even about marriage, but hey, sounds nice. I'll keep using it at weddings. Um, but 1 Corinthians 13, it's actually in the midst of a Jesus community wanting to help people encounter the living God. And that's where this comes from. That's what we're jumping into today. And there's gonna be a few moments in this passage where we're actually gonna discover some of the spiritual gifts called out. And I'm just gonna just call them out and say, and just hold off for a few weeks. We're gonna get to them. We're gonna unpack them for three weeks, all the different spiritual gifts, okay? But I'm just gonna pause because I actually wanna do them justice. And so I'm gonna skim over them a little bit. You can just write down if you have a question and we'll get back to it later, okay? But here we go. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse one. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, talking about spiritual gifts, get that in a second, but don't have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. He's like, I can be really eloquent with my words. I can be really good at talking with people, buttering them up. In fact, I can have the spiritual gift of speaking a heavenly language. We'll unpack that, okay? It's like, what does that mean? It's like, we'll unpack it, okay? Don't worry, just chill out, right? It's like, I can have all that. He's like, but, and this is where he's getting at, and this is where we're focusing today. He's like, but do not have love. I can have all these spiritual gifts, but if I don't have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. In the original Greek, it's literally like, I'm like two pieces of metal being slapped together. It's annoying. You ever, you ever, it's like, a, he's literally like, it's a gong show, okay? When Jesus' people leverage their spiritual gifts, but have not love, it's a gong show. Do you know what gongs do? They annoy people and they repel people. Some of you, you're like, I'm not a church person because I've been to the gong show. My neighbor was a gong show. I don't know, right? That's the reality. That's what he's saying. They annoy people. They repel people. Chris Steves, all, he's our worship pastor here, always looking for volunteers. He's not hiring a gong player. We're not looking for it because it's annoying and it repels people. And Paul's like, listen, listen, listen. I don't care how talented you are. I don't care the spiritual gifts that God has given you. If you operate in them and do not operate in love, you're a gong show and you are repelling people instead of drawing them in and helping them encounter God. And he continues, if I have the gift of prophecy, the ability to speak what God is saying to the world and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge that God speaks to me for others, I can have that. And if I, and I have faith that can move mountains, I want that kind of faith, but don't have love, 
I'm nothing. It's like, it doesn't matter what gifts you have. If you have not love, it's just a gong show. He continues. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but don't have love, I gain nothing. I can do great things, spiritual things. I can take care of orphans and widows. I can do all those incredible things. But if I have not love, I have nothing. Let me bottom line what Paul is saying. Write this down if you're a note taker. This is so key. Gifts without character are no gift at all. Gifts without character are no gift at all. Gifts without character are no gift at all. And then Paul then just is like, so can I tell you what I mean by love? And then he unpacks it. And this is the wedding passage, right? But it wasn't talking about that, but it's still practical for weddings because we're called to love our wives and our husbands. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. He continues. It doesn't dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. And he continues. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And so for the remainder of our time today, I want to teach you a little bit about love. Now, I know you're thinking, you're like, Mark, we would love to learn about love. I'm not sure you're the person who should be teaching it. Because on Easter Sunday, you shared a little story where you told us, and you were honest, and we appreciate your honesty, but you kind of showed your cards, and you told us that even your wife thinks you have no relational tact. Remember that? It's like, so how are you going to teach us about love? Here's, here's the reality, is that I'm just like you. That I could probably use some help in the love department. In fact, if we were to take a poll and you don't have to raise your hand of all the people who feel like I could probably gain a few points in the love department, you know, we'd probably have a lot of hands up and the hands that weren't up, the person next to them would be like, your hand should be up, right? <laughs> like we could all, so let's look at this less as me telling you what to do and us just on a quest to discover this idea of what love is. And the reason it's so important is because Paul is talking about uh, the idea of love, but he's speaking in ancient Greek. Which is actually really cool because while, you know, 2,000 years ago they didn't have tablets and phones and technology, they weren't where we are now, they had some things that we don't have that I wish we had. One of the things they had was they had four different words to describe love, which is really helpful on a day like today when I tell my wife, happy Mother's Day, baby, I love you. And she's just going through her, you know, playback because she remembers stuff and she's like, and yesterday you loved your Big Mac, right? It's like... Same word, loses the power, right? The Greeks had four different words for this. They had a word for friendship love. They had a word for sacrificial love. They had a, a word called eros. That was the, what I call bow chicka wow wow kind of love, right? Like they had a word for every kind of love. So it was clear. It's like, no, this is a friend. This is eros, right? It's like, okay, right? Like that's really clear. That's very helpful. So they could explain. So it's like love is not this catch-all term that we use for sandwiches and for people that we are children, but they actually had different words. And so the really cool thing is we can go back and say, what was the Greek word that Paul used that we had no choice when we translated into English to simply put the word love? And it was this very simple word called agape. Agape. Turn to the person next to you and say agape. Say, I agape you. But you don't know what kind of love that is. That could be really awkward. No, no, it's good. Don't worry. That the way to describe agape is warm regard for an interest in another. And that's really helpful. Because when we're talking about love, just go back for a sec to agape. When we're, we're talking about love, most people, when you ask them, are you loving, they kind of do a little, little mental check and they're like, well, I'm not the opposite of love, which we say is hate, so I must be loving. Right? So I'm not that, so I must be that. But the interesting thing is when we look at the idea of agape love, the opposite is actually not hate. That's a common misunderstanding that love, if I, if I don't love, then I hate, and if I hate, then I don't love. It's actually not true. Agape, if I could summarize it, means to seeking the best for the others around you. A warm regard for an interest in another, seeking their desires and needs before your own. That the opposite of that is not hate. The opposite of seeking the best for others is seeking the best for yourself. 
that the opposite of love is not hate, but it's actually self-love. And that's really helpful, isn't it? Because I've talked to a lot of people in a lot of really hard situations. People going through relational challenges and hard times. And there are times where people, it's like, how did the marriage end and what led to it? And they'll say, it was just, it was just a hateful person. It was, but rarely is that the case. You know what the majority of the time it is? It's that their interest was way too much over here instead of over here. Were they loving? Did they have the feeling? Yeah, yeah, they had it all. But at the core of their being, when the honeymoon phase was over, all of a sudden that was distilled to the surface. And it was like, there was a self-focus. And the more you talk, it's like, and you realize it, it wasn't just one party. It was that we had trouble because we both had this drive for self-focus. But the challenge is when we have this understanding, love and hate, we say, I'm not hateful, so I must be loving. It's like, but actually the opposite of love is this idea of self-focus, selfishness, pride. And that is a totally different game. And all of a sudden it starts to resonate with you and makes us like, yeah, I'm, I definitely fight for my team more often than the other team. That I'm often looking out for my own interests. If I'm gut level honest, most of the decisions I make are because they make me feel better, not for others. That's the natural tendency that we're born with. Scripture would call that our sin nature, to look out for ourselves instead of others. God is other focused. We are self-centered. You ever question that theology? Just look at your children. They don't come out of the womb wanting to share my toy. Our daughter's in that stage now. It's awesome. She's so angry. My toy. She's like, that's what it is. We're like, no, 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 Kaya's loving. Kaya's loving, Kaya's share. We have to teach this. We have to teach this because we're born with this. And if we don't do any work, this is where we stay. And this destroys relationships. You don't have to be a religious person to believe that. You just have to be a human being who's lived in the world and been in relationships. Relationships don't crumble because of hate. They crumble because of self-love, selfishness, pride. And it's something that we all struggle with. The bottom line is that so many Christians, myself included, mess up this ability to help other people encounter God, not because we're hateful, but because we look out for number one, that love is not our way of operating. Agape love is not our way of operating. The love of others, the interest of others, a warm regard for an interest in others is not our primary mode of operation. And we've heard so many people We've even used our gifts and our talents that God has given us. And we don't realize it, but it's the undercurrent of pride and self-focus and self-centeredness that can ruin so much. Let me kind of walk you through it. Just go through this verse, give you some examples, just highlight some of the words that are in this passage. I don't have time to go through the whole passage. So love is patient and it is kind. Do you know what patience is? Do you know what patience is? Patience is really interesting. It's when someone inconveniences you and wants to do something that isn't on your timeline, and you say, it's okay, I'm willing to, to be inconvenienced a little bit for the sake of your timeline. That's what patience is, and that is love. Self-centered people are the opposite. They're hurried, they're rough, they're only thinking of others, they're, they're never thinking of other people's timeline, they're only thinking of their timeline. It's that person in the airport that butts, it's like, sorry, sorry, my flight's about to go. I have to get in line in front of you. And it's like, they didn't ask to see if you were actually on the exact same flight, but they just checked. That's, that's impatience. And that is not loving because it is focused on ourselves instead of others. One of uh, my favorite examples of, of seeing love made out in patience is, I don't know if this, this still happens or this kind of language happens. I haven't dated in a long time. That's a good thing. You should be happy with that because I've been married for a long time too. Um, but I remember like when I was a teenager, one of, the, one of the things that would happen, chat with friends and stories you hear, maybe you've experienced this, where you're in a relationship with someone and they're kind of pushing the physical boundaries of your comfort level. And it's like, oh, it's just, uh, it's like uh, it's just, and you just kind of feel like you're just like, can we just pause? Like, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that. And can you keep your hands off? And just, right, you just, you've reached that point where it's just like, uh, and then they kind of come out with these lines. They're so lame. Somehow they work. It's like, but baby, I love you. I just want to be with you forever. And then they drop this one. This is, maybe, maybe they don't drop this anymore, but they used to drop this in my day. It's like, we just gotta, I want to be with you forever. I want to marry you, but we, we should test drive the car first. We should test drive the car first. Because I mean, you wouldn't buy a car without test driving it. So let's just make sure that you know, everything works. We should, we should do that. That's just due diligence. Our parents taught us to be responsible to do due diligence. So 
we should do that, right? And it's just like, oh, you got me. That's a good point. My dad always test drove cars before he bought used ones. So <laughs> I, guess, I guess he'd be okay with this. And I'm always like, oh, you know what just happened. This is what I want to tell every person who's ever been in that situation. I'm like, no pastor maybe has ever said this in history, but I believe you should test drive the car. I just don't think test driving sexual intimacy test drives the car for marriage. That's not testing the car. I think when you want to test drive the car for marriage, you want to see, do they have this or do they have this? And guess what? The question they just asked told you where they are. They are here. The car's been tested, baby. (laughs) Eharmony.com, that's what's in your future, bro. (laughs) That if they, oh, I just need to, I'll I'll die if we don't. It's like, you're not going to die. Shut up. But you know what you are? You're focused on yourself. You're so romantic. You buy me amazing things. Your poems, that song you wrote me on the beach, the guitar, amazing. But guess what? You're here, baby. And it's not doing it. Then here's the bottom line. Sexual intimacy does not predict, and sexual chemistry does not predict decades of a happy marriage. You know what does? Sacrificial love. When you want to test drive the car, look for a man, look for a woman who lives in response to the spirit of God and who is other focused, who is patient, says, I know I have needs and I know I have wants, but I want to honor your timeline. I want to wait. All of a sudden you say, that's a trajectory that can work itself out. And here's the bottom line. In the long run, this wins in the bedroom every time. Just saying. (laughs) If I had a mic, I'd drop it (laughs) now. Tangent over. Let's go to the next one. Love is kind. Oh, sorry, back one, back one, sorry. Love is patient. That word now has a whole new meaning for a lot of you, right? Love is kind. Do you know what kindness is? Kindness is a response to weakness and offense. That's literally what it means. Kindness is not your ability to walk someone you just met across the street and say, have a nice day, ma'am, much obliged to you, right? Like, that's not, that's nice. You should do that. Please do that. We need that more. But that's not what kindness was. Kindness was a response to weakness or offense. It was when someone hurts you, it wasn't, we're never talking it again. It was a moving back towards them and saying, I'm going to fight for this. I'm not going to let what you just did to me, sweetheart. I'm not going to let what you just did to me, son or daughter. I'm not going to make you pay for that. I'm actually going to move in the opposite direction that you just chose to go. Kindness is moving back towards a person who has inconvenienced or offended you because it is a characteristic of love and love is other focus, not self focus. That is agape love, and that is what Paul is saying. If you don't have that, you don't have that, you have nothing. Next verse, he talks about love keeps no record of wrongs. This is a tough one, because we all, no matter how disorganized and how much you hate administration, we all are expert at filing in relationship, aren't we? Someone does something, he's like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, that was an accident, it'll never happen again. It's like, really? Because back in 2004, if I remember correctly, you did that three times and you said you'd never do it again then. It's like, isn't it amazing that our filing cabinet works amazing for other people's screw ups, but never for our own? (laughs) Never when someone screws up, it's like, hey bro, don't worry about it. I did that to you last week. I raised my tone. I used that tone of voice with you last week. I sent an angry text. We never remember that. It's like the filing cabinet. We just burn it at the end of the day. Except for what the other people did. Those ones, we just lock them down. We got decades. Can't remember what you ate for breakfast yesterday, but you remember what they did 20 years ago to you. Because we love keeping records of wrongs. Because that serves us. But agape love does not keep record of wrong. Because agape love is based on God's love. God who is willing to die on the cross and forgive all the sins that we ever committed and ever would commit and never keep record of wrong. God who never forgets anything says he has chosen to forget our sin. Tangent, some of you keep remembering your sins and won't forgive yourself. God's already forgiven you. You need to let go of that and let go of those files. Keeps no record of wrong. So the thing that we need to deal with if we want to be the type of community that helps people encounter God is we need to be loving, which means we need to move away from being self-centered. And the interesting thing about being self-centered is there's actually two ways that it plays out. One that's more common that we know about. The other one's just as common, but we would never call it pride or self-centered. But I'll explain very gently how I actually believe that it is too. First of all, self-centered, there's arrogance. 
which says, I am so good. We all know that. We all know people like that. It's just like, I'm so good. I'm so odd. Look at me. I look at all the likes. Right? Like, it's just like the people who are just like, no, no, just give me the mic. Let me do it. Let me fix that. Let me, right? It's like, just sit down. I got this. Let me, let me just make the pie for, right? Like, it's just like, they are the everything. They got it on lock, okay? So there's that side of self-centered people. That's the arrogant side. But here's the one that kind of hides in the shadows and yet is just as destructive. Insecurity. Arrogance says, I'm so good. Insecurity says, I'm no good. You're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like my insecurity is something I'm working on. It's really hard. I'm, like, I'm not disagreeing with you. I struggle with insecurity too. But you need to realize that insecurity is also focused on self. And insecurity unchecked and undealt with will also destroy a church because it will stop us from using our gifts and receiving from God and giving it to people because if I'm so insecure and I'm so overwhelmed by how much better you are than me, God may give me a word for you or an encouragement for you, but I will never release it and I will never share it with you because I'm so focused on myself and how much I am failing in comparison to you. That insecurity is also an area of self-centeredness that the focus is on ourselves. And, and Paul's not judging this, and I'm not judging this. I'm telling you, I live out both these things all the time. It's like my modus operandi. Is that the right word? Oh, that sounded smart, but I'm, I don't, it worked. Did it work? Did it, I, don't, I couldn't spell it, that's for sure. Okay, but like, I live here. You do too. And so Paul's saying like, but we need to deal with this. Because once we get out of this, this is what comes. And this is the thing that is actually gonna be a gift to the world. And the, the people here that aren't church people, aren't Christians, you should pray. You're like, I don't even believe God. It's like, you should pray anyways, that we would step into this, that we would move away from lives that are focused on ourselves and we would accept this destiny that God has given every single one of us, which is to move away from self-centeredness, to move away from arrogance, to move away from insecurity, and actually to move towards allowing the Spirit of God to work through us to love others so that they can encounter his love through us. That even as a a preacher, I'll give you a personal example. I'll help on the insecurity piece. Um, I was talking to someone recently and I'm like, for a long time, for years as a preacher, I literally felt like vomiting before every single time I got up on stage. It's like, oh, you feel so natural there. I'm like, no, I literally wanted to vomit every time I came up. I was just so nervous. I was so worried. And I'd get off like, babe, I do, I do a good job. Did I say something dumb? It's like, you always say something dumb, right? It's like, oh, thanks, babe, right? It's like, I was so insecure. And I had, had this one pastor and he just said something that was so brilliant and it changed the insecurity game. He said, when you're nervous about preaching, you are worried about how people are viewing you. He said, you need to flip the script on that. He said, there's an 18-year-old kid in your church that you need to imagine every single week who's given God one more chance. And you have the opportunity. God's grace has allowed you a microphone and you get to speak God truths and God's words to that child to let them know they are loved, they have a destiny, that God has a plan for their life. And you're gonna waste your time being worried about how people feel about you and how you sound or are you gonna focus on how I'm going to gift you to speak to that person? All of a sudden, that moment shifts things and insecurity goes away because you're now on mission. That's the same thing with spiritual gifts. When you move past insecurity, you're not worried about how people view you, you're worried about how they encounter God. And that takes away insecurity in a moment. Paul needs us to deal with this. Because we can pray that prayer I taught you in the Holy Spirit series, right? More, Lord, I want more of you. God's not gonna run out of Holy Spirit. The question is, do we have the character to contain and release it? If we don't have the character, if we don't have the integrity, if we don't have the love for it, we will be a clanging gong. We will be a joke in this city. But the opposite is true. And we will transform this region. That we will be people that embody the love of God, the agape love. So the bottom line is we need, we need to not just be gifted by the Spirit and operating in that, but we need to have the character to follow it because gifts without character are no gift at all. There it is. And so I want to teach you this very complex prayer in a moment. We're going to put it on the screen. You can write it down, take a picture of it because it's very complex, lots of words. It's going to be very, very hard for you to remember. But if you get this prayer right, I promise you, you'll become more loving. You ready for it? Here it is. God, make me more loving. God, make me more loving. It's actually a very simple prayer, and I promise you God will answer it. The problem is you will miss the answer and run away from the answer if you don't understand God's character and how he moves. So the prayer is easy. The living out of the answer is very hard. Let me tell you why. Because when you say, God, make me more loving, 
His nature and character never changes. And when you read the scriptures and when you look at the way that he operates, God uses the circumstances in our life, the positive and the negative, to grow our character. All throughout scripture, you see, it's not just people saying, God, make me more loving. It's like, bloop, I'm more loving. It's like, no, no, God gives them opportunities to be loving. God, I want to be more patient. It's like God's going to give you an opportunity to be more patient. Then Hebrews, it talks about how he uses our suffering to train us. In Romans, it says, suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. It's like, he's going to work it. He's going to grow. It's like going to the gym and like working out some muscles you've never worked out before, but you grow in it. That's how God works through his spirit. He puts us in situations and invites us to stay in them instead of run from them. And that's when we grow in patience. That's when we grow in love. That's when we grow in our ability to long suffer. So when you say, God, make me more loving, he might bring you someone that you have no patience for and say, love them. And all of a sudden you're growing in your patience. Say, God, make me more loving. He tells you, he's like, well, loving means sometimes suffering long-term and brings you an opportunity to suffer long-term. And he has to, he has to. You say, but couldn't I just pray? And could he just make me more loving? It's like, yeah, but then how would you know you had it? Unless you encountered someone who tested your patience and then all of a sudden you were more patient. You won't know unless he gives you the opportunity to grow it. That's how he works. In fact, the word character in the Greek is actually the word for carving. That is literally this idea of he's carving his character into us. When we pray that prayer, God, make me more loving, we're asking him to start breaking things in our hearts, to start transforming, to literally carve his image into us. It sounds beautiful, but it also sounds really painful. And that's true, but that's good. Because here's the reality. No matter what you believe, no matter where you come from, every single one of us wants more love in this world. And God would tell us, in the way I make you stronger, the way I grow your character, the way I make you more loving is actually by putting you in situations and inviting you to stay in instead of run away. So I want to teach you a question to ask when God starts answering this question, God, make me more loving. All of a sudden, someone's testing your patience. Someone's making it really hard. There's a question I want you to ask God in the midst of the difficulty that will really help you. I was, I taught it, someone taught me years ago. It has changed my life. Literally, weekly, I use this principle and you will as well because unless you're a hobbit who lives alone with no other people, every week you encounter people, every week you'll have opportunities to move towards love or away from it. Okay, so I'm going to teach you uh, and I, uh, a, a question to ask God. I made it into a song, so it's memorable. You okay with that? Yeah. You okay if I sing it? Yeah. You okay singing it with me? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> excellent. All right, so number one, I need you to stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Worship leader tells you to stand up. You stand up. Pastor tells you to stand up. You're, ner- you're nervous, right? All right, here's what we're going to do. And we're going we're gonna, to, if you like karaoke, give me a big wave. Is that a thing in Guelph? Karaoke. All right. You hate karaoke. Doesn't matter. You came to church today. We're all going to do it together, okay? And not only that, but then there's, there's a side of you. It's like, I don't like karaoke, but I like competition. Give me a wave if you like competition. And if you like way- winning. All the people who are competitive, like nobody's competitive and likes losing. Let, those two don't go together, okay? So anyways, so we actually, literally, I talked to the sound guys, they have a device in their hand. I don't know what it's called, but they're gonna measure the sound of the room. I have a microphone, you don't, but you have like 750 of you and it's just me. And we're gonna see who's louder, okay? So just to get warmed up, I'm gonna get you to clap. Some of you've never clapped before, just follow my lead. Just, there you go. You guys are doing great. All right, now. Just a little practice to warm up your vocal cords. If you were born before 1984, give me a shout. Okay, after 1984, give me a shout. All right, so this is 1984. I'm gonna sing it, you're gonna repeat it. Tina Turner. What's love got to do with it, got to do with it? Your turn. My turn. What's love got to do with it? Got to do with it. Oh! What's love got to do with it? Got to do with it. Oh, sit down. <laughs> Sound guys, who won? Ooh, that was real close. But uh, I think they got you beat, Mark. <laughs> yeah! Good work, guys. Give yourselves a hand. I need some water. So take a break. What's love got to do with it? Never forget that. Never forget that. Never forget that. 
That is a question that I want to continue to drive you to pray. That in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the broken relationship, in that moment when you just want to run, you remember, God, I asked you to make me more loving because I want to be the kind of person and part of this lakeside community that helps people encounter you. So I genuinely want to be more loving, but this sucks and this is really hard. So God, what does love have to do with this? What are you trying to shape in me? What about your character are you trying to grow in me? What about your image are you trying to carve into me in this moment? Because it sucks and I want to run. But what does love have to do with it? That it will always be in the midst of relationship. I so badly want us to grow in character and I wish I could just give you a sermon that makes you all more loving and me more loving, but it will not come from sitting and taking notes and reading your Bible. It will come when we are obedient to the lives God has called us to, which is staying in the midst of a hard relationship, being patient, long suffering, going hard, going long. That is the way in which he's gonna grow us in this so that when we actually use our spiritual gifts, which we start talking about next week, it is actually a gift to the people who receive it because we are people who walk and live in the spirit that we move towards relationship when everyone is running away. That when things are crumbling, when things are chaotic, when there's pain and you wanna quit and you wanna run away from the marriage or you are praying that your child chooses residence instead of staying at home or you are hoping for a new contract at work, you're hoping for a new environment, you're hopping for, hoping for a new office mate, you just pause and before you make a decision, you ask God, what has got love got to do with it? This week on Monday, I'm telling you, every week this is a reality in my life and it will be for you once you start asking God this question. I, uh, I get an email and I get a letter and uh, you have those people in your life, maybe it's just me, but like people in your life that like when you see their email come through or their phone number on the caller ID or like you see them coming up your steps and you're just like, this isn't good. It's like, you have no idea. You haven't even read the subject line, but you just kind of, does anyone else get those or am I the only one? Okay, all right. So I got two of those on one day. I'm like, come on, at least spread them out. I got two, I got an email and a letter. And like, that's my anxiety. My anxiety is rooted in how other people view me. And so I was just like, oh boy, this is not gonna be good. And so I literally like, I'm just like, I'm sweating, my heart's racing. And then I was like, babe, can you help me for a second? She's like, yeah, I can help you with the chores. I'm like, no, 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 don't help me with the chores. I'm good with the chores. Can you just open this letter for me and read it first? Because I, I, I couldn't even do that. I was so paralyzed by anxiety, scared of what they were gonna say this time. And, and sure enough, it wasn't lovely. In fact, at one point, I was actually like, maybe they're just writing us a letter to tell us they're leaving the country. I literally thought that, okay? I actually prayed that. <laughs> Tuesday morning, show up, staff meeting. I'm feeling heavy as I'm, as I'm going out the door. My wife literally, as I'm leaving, is like, by the way, that person emailed back to see if we got their email. I'm like, thanks for ruining my day. <laughs> no, but anyway, so I'm like, I'm feeling so heavy. My wife's awesome. I love her so much. She's so amazing. And... Uh, and so I, I get to the office and we have staff prayer and staff worship time. And Jeff Grinwald, our senior leader, who I love, uh, is leading our time. And he's just like, we're gonna do things differently today. And he just starts strumming his guitar and he's just like, I'm just gonna read a passage of scripture. I'm just gonna walk you through. And so masterfully just walks us through a psalm. And where does our help come from? And just gives us some space. I love that. We just, we just even as a staff, just like learn to listen to God's voice. And so this moment, where I'm just like, these are the things that I just, I just want dealt with and I'm just asking God to deal with them. This question comes to mind. It's like, Mark, those two people that reached out are divine appointments that I've set up. And you have an opportunity to love them. In fact, one of them, one of the letters, the person actually included their phone number in case I had any questions about the things they had written. It's like, I've given you an opportunity to reach out and because you've been trying so hard at this relationship and it's like everything that you do thinking is loving, they just receive is not loving and get more angry. He's like, I literally, and so I, I literally was just like in that moment and you know, I was telling Daniel about this story and he's like, and what happened to your anxiety? I'm like, it shifted because all of a sudden insecurity didn't operate anymore. All of a sudden I had heard from the creator of the universe that love has something to do with these two messages that just came to you. And I'm inviting you to reach out to them and have conversations. And so I reached out to both of them and I didn't like wait till the end of the week to do it because I was actually excited because I thought God was doing something this moment. Did it, was there still heavy lifting to do? Absolutely. So I got a hold of one. The other one, I'm gonna have to keep calling back till I get a hold of them. But the first one, I think we had the first positive phone call we've ever had in the history of our relationship. And that's because you just continue to, it's not because I'm awesome, because God's awesome. And he just continues. When we say, God, make me more loving, he's like, good, till death do his part. I'm gonna continue to grow that in you, in your spirit, every week of your life. Are you gonna choose to move towards the pain and the brokenness or away from it? Lakeside, I want us to be a church that moves towards it, that continues to say, God, it's gonna be painful, 
but I so hunger and thirst after a world that encounters your love that is worth a little bit of pain for long-term gain. And so God, we wanna be more loving. And God, we wanna move towards the mess. And I wanna just pause just as we're about to close. I wanna invite the band to come up. And I just wanna say, some of you, you're in a category that's totally different. That there's abuse in a relationship. There's things going on that are horrible. I just, I just need to say something that, that is different than I have for everybody else, which is number one, you need to know that it is not your fault. No matter how many times the person that you're in relationship with that is doing this to you says, well, it's because you did this and because you did that, they make their own choices. And what they are doing is not your fault. You have no responsibility to stay in and continue to receive the pain that they are giving you. That to go back may not be the right move. To move back towards the relationship in this season where it is unsafe is not selfish, but maybe the most loving thing that you could do to protect yourself and protect those that you are responsible for. That the most loving thing that you could actually do is maybe stop enabling, to lay down some boundaries, maybe to call the police and report what's been happening. So I just want to make that clear because so often I, I usually encounter that when I teach this kind of message, someone comes up and has that question. So let me just make it clear. I'm not saying go back into an abusive relationship and go back into that. I'm saying God doesn't want that for you, doesn't want that for your children or the people that you love. So please don't just say, well, you just got to tough it out and it's a spiritual gift to get beaten. Like what? No, it's not. But on the flip side, for every one person that that is their narrative that they need to move away from relationship and that is maybe the most loving thing they can do. For every one of those, there's probably 50 of us who are trying to run away and opt out of a relationship that God is so clearly saying, go back, call back. It's Mother's Day. You weren't planning on calling them, but call because I want to grow this love in you because it's not about you. It's about me. It's about me, people encountering me because I want them to know their heavenly father and I'm choosing you in this moment in this difficult relationship. It's how I'm gonna carve my character into you. Let's just pray and ask the spirit of God. Holy Spirit, who are you inviting us to move towards? We wanna be more loving. It's an easy prayer to say, but it's a hard thing to live out. So bring to mind as we pause the person, the one person. We'll start with baby steps. There might be 10, but we'll take one right now. One person that you want us to move towards, to call, to reach out to, to have coffee with. Bring that person to mind right now, Jesus. head out on Mother's Day. I want to remind you our prayer teams, they're working their way up to the front. They're up here to pray for you and any need that you have, they're happy to pray for. And as well, we have a, a photo booth out in the hall. So whether you're here with a mom, with friends, with your bros, uh, it's just a photo booth. There's some signs for moms. There's some signs for 2019 and love and whatever. We just want you to have a great time celebrating whatever you are celebrating today. And uh, so just don't miss that after you grab your kids, but do that before you grab, no, do it after you grab your kids. I want to just bless you as you go. Bless you with courage. This is not easy, but when God speaks, you know he goes with you and darkness trembles. So courage as you step into day by day, living out this agape love, the spirit of God moving in you to bless others. In Jesus' name, see you next week.